Welcome to Saga Thing, a podcast where we put the sagas of the Icelanders on trial. I'm John. And I'm Andy. Each week, we'll pick a saga, provide a brief summary, and then judge the actions of the characters at the Saga Thing. Excellent. Andy, what are we doing this week? Well, let me open up the bag and see what we've got here. Oh, looks like a good one. This week on Saga Thing, meet... Provenkel Frasegothi, a proud bully of a chieftain who learns that sleeping in too late can sometimes lead to trouble. Meet the toe-pulling farmer, Thorbjorn, and his hapless son, Einar, who discovers the value of keeping one's word. Sam Bjarnason, an unimaginatively named lawyer who dabbles in gruesome acts of torture. His lavishly dressed brother, Avind. And the noble Thjosterson brothers, Thorkel and Thorgeir, who sometimes travel great distances to lend a hand to the weak, and sometimes don't. Meet them all this week in... Hroffenkel's Saga! Alright, so here's a little background on the, the saga. Uh, Jonas Christensen described this saga as... A cautionary tale about a proud and obstinate chieftain who's brought low by his violence, learns humility from bitter experience, and rises to honor anew through his resolution. What do you think of that uh, summary of it, John? One of the things I like about Christensen is he gives you that sort of brief uh, introduction to the sagas, but doesn't actually uh, tell you anything useful. And I like that because that <laughs> means that we get to do the work of giving you the useful information. Uh, exactly. So I'm going to start us off... Uh, I'll explain the background of our saga. Uh, this saga was probably written in the late 13th century, although the earliest surviving manuscript fragments date from a couple of centuries after that. Uh, it's a short saga, isn't it? Yeah, it's. Uh, we're going to try with these uh, podcasts to keep a, a list of the different lengths uh, by by words. This saga comes in at 9,124 Icelandic words, uh, which makes it one of the shortest sagas. Typically in... Uh, in English editions, it comes in around 20 pages in length, which is uh, makes it one of the shorter sagas. Right. I'm, I'm pretty sure there are thought that are actually longer than that. Short stories uh, in Icelandic that are actually longer than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the interesting point about the saga is that it's not only brief, which means that it's, uh, it's accessible for people, and it shows up a lot in anthologies and so forth as the Icelandic text. Uh, it's also become kind of a battleground for people debating the historical reality of the sagas. Uh, the saga was originally read as more or less historically accurate uh, until Sigurd Nordal in 1940 essentially disproved uh, the saga's facts, uh, uh, demonstrating that many of the things the saga uh, hung its hat on uh, for its time and place and so forth couldn't be demonstrated to be true, and in fact in many cases could be demonstrated to be false. Mm-hmm. Uh, since then, Ravikil's saga has been at the heart of debates about the historical value of the sagas, but it's still been read as a near-perfect mini-saga composed by a sil- skilled saga writer. Absolutely. And if you, um, if you take any uh, classes in the sagas, you always run into Hrofenkel as one of the first um, sagas in that class. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are learning Old Norse, uh, one of the sagas you might translate simply because of length, again, is uh, Hrofenkel's saga. And mm-hmm. it's a good test case for a lot of the theories about saga literature um, that we see in the scholarship. Um, one of the things we want to do really quick is provide a little bit of background information, a little bit of refresher for you in case you uh, forgot or maybe didn't listen to Shame on You, our first episode where we gave background on Icelandic culture. Full of facts to know and share. Yes. So um, I'm just going to remind you really quickly a little bit about the thing, what the thing is, and a little bit about the Gothi and Thing Man relationship because those are important for this saga as well as any saga you read. Um, but because this one's short, it really uh, centers on the action at a, at the all thing. So, as we discussed in our first episode uh, in much greater detail than we will here, medieval Iceland was a commonwealth of independent people. In other words, that means there's no central government. What they did have, however, were regional assemblies of free men, which they called things. Thus, the name of our podcast, Saga Thing. At the thing in Iceland, uh, the purpose was to settle lawsuits, to oversee payment of debts, and to handle any administrative issues for the region. Typical thing met in springtime and was governed by the Godar, or leading men or chieftains, however you want to say it, of the region. Each of these Gothi, that's the singular for Godar, so a Gothi is a chieftain, each Gothi would arrive at the thing with a band of thing men. 
Like the more familiar vassal-lord relationship, the thing-man-go-the relationship was a reciprocal one that required the one to support the other in most public arenas of conflict. The thing-man, like the vassal, would swear allegiance to the go the of his choice, though it's not as formal as the uh, vassal-lord relationship. Mm -hmm. Unlike the vassal, the Icelandic thingman was free to come and go as he pleased. Uh, he was free to shift allegiances where he saw fit and to let the Gothi fall to his enemies without the guarantee of vengeance, which is not usual for a vassal-lord relationship. Um, those of you who have read Nibelung and Lied will know all about that. Uh, at the same time, though the Gothi was expected to support his thingmen, he was under no sacred or legal obligation to do so. So he could just uh, abandon his thing men if he wanted to. He didn't have to support them in any legal cases. And he didn't have to go into battle uh, to support some, some thing men who did something stupid. It's really up to him whether he wants to support him or not. So, so it's sort a, of government more, by real-time popularity contest. Yeah, it's, it's a real-time popularity. That's great. Yeah, it, it's up to you what you want to do when you want to do it. Um, that's the problem with independent people, but it's also the really nice thing about being independent. So according to tradition, this is how a thing would work. The thing would be presided over by three Godar who would hallow the grounds. Remember, chieftains, uh, as we talked about in our first episode, chieftains are both uh, political leaders uh, or secular leaders, but they're also religious leaders. They, they are the priests of uh, pagan Iceland. Now, according to tradition, the thing would be presided over by three Godar uh, who would hallow the ground and select 12 judges from their group of thingmen who would hear the cases brought to the thing. And this same model, though on a much larger scale, holds true for the national all thing, which met every year for roughly two weeks around midsummer at Thingveller, which translates to thing plain in the southwest of Iceland. All right, so that's our brief uh, reminder about things and go thee and thing men and all that kind of stuff to help ground you um, for what's about to happen in this particular saga. All right, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about this saga? Give us a quick summary. Great. Hravenkel's saga begins with the arrival of Hravenkel Hallfredersen and his parents in eastern Iceland toward the end of the settlement age, so early to mid-10th century. Hravenkel's father follows a dream vision that warns him away from his first choice of homestead. He narrowly avoids a landslide that kills a couple of goats he leaves behind. His second choice is better, and his farm is prosperous. Uh, Hra John, John, why, why is he leaving goats behind? That's an excellent question, and I want to talk about that. Um, I don't know. Uh, all I can assume is that they were either obnoxious goats that he didn't like, um, or that he didn't have room for them on the cart. Gotcha. Um, okay. I think they're right, supposed then. to be actually elderly goats. Elderly so maybe they goats. were maybe they were goats that no longer gave milk, and so he just didn't bother with them. Uh, does it actually say elderly goats in the I think text? it actually does, yes. Okay, so they, they weren't ready for the trip. All right, then. Right. Carry on. Uh, so Robigel starts his own farm, eventually, at the far end of the valley. Uh, he rises to a position of prominence and eventually becomes the local chieftain. Uh, he's known as a harsh chieftain. His own men are treated well, but he's thought of as Oyavnathar an unfair man and a bit of a bully to those who oppose him. A what? Uh, Oyavnathar uh, an uneven-handed oh. man, is the literal translation there. May I try that? Please. Uh, I think that's probably as well as I did. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, um, All right. Ravikil gets a bad reputation. He gets that reputation because he refuses to pay compensation for the men he kills in duels. Uh, Ravikil is also a religious man whose love of the god Frey leads both to his nickname, Ravikil Frey's Gothi, and to his dedicating his favorite horse, which he calls Frey Faxi, to the god. Uh, and at this point, one of Hravenkel's neighbors enters the story, Thorbjorn, the poor head of a large family. Thorbjorn's oldest son, Einar, comes to Hravenkel seeking work late in the season after his father sends him away to earn money. Due to the awkward timing, he's forced to take up shepherding for Hravenkel. Yeah, that, that awkward timing is really unfortunate. It's, the father yes. comes to the son and says something like, uh, I should have told you earlier <laughs> that I can't afford to keep you here anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't you go seek your fortune? And he ends up at Hrofenkel's place. And then Hrofenkel offers him the worst possible job. Well, and he does say, if you'd arrived you know, at the normal job-seeking time, I'd have found something better for you. Yeah, but Hrofenkel's one of those guys where 
what he says and what he means are often two different things. It's it's quite possible since shepherding sheep, uh, these milk ewes especially that he's he's going to take care of, that's typically a job reserved for young boys. Yes. Um, so it could be Horovankel, one of those guys that uh, he, he's wealthy, he's powerful, and he's really sticking it to people that he knows are <laughs> inferior to him. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll, I, I will, I'm sure we'll hit that kind Keeping of them in concept place. again as we analyze his character. Well, and speaking of his character, uh, during this job interview, Horovankel also drops this rather curious warning about the horse Freyfaxi. Um, no one is allowed to ride the horse. Einar can oh. ride any other horse in the herd. But Hrovenkel has sworn an oath to kill anyone who rides Freyfaxi. That's quite reasonable. Sure. Uh, and of course, as narrative demands, a group of lost sheep mean that Einar needs a horse in a hurry, and Freyfaxi is the only one he can catch from the herd. Right. Aren't the the other horses are out frolicking? Yes, at the and they, time, right? they frolic in a direction away from Einar. Right. He can't he can't catch anyone. But, right. But oh, Freyfaxi, Freyfaxi standing on his dignity. <laughs> Does not frolic Stands and is still therefore is a mounted. statue ready uh, to go. Right. But after a day of hard riding, Einar finds the sheep, and they're actually not far from where he started. And when he dismounts, uh, Freyfaxi, sweating and frothing, bolts and runs to Hrovenkel's door where he interrupts supper. Hrovenkel <laughs> calmly sends the horse away after promising to avenge his mistreatment. So are, are you implying that the horse came to tattle? Yes, it's exactly what is going on. Uh, and Provenkel, I, I want to be clear, is not sort of shaking his fist at the heavens and promising to avenge this mistreatment. He pats the horse and whispers in his ear, Fear not, I will avenge your ill treatment. Right. At which point it, the horse calms right down and goes back to his herd. Right. If I remember correctly, he, he calls him my fosterling. Like, that's like that's saying my, my, that is correct. my dear adopted child. Right, my I will, stepson. I will take care of you. And he's as good as his word. The next morning, Ravenkel rides up to the shepherd's hut wearing a dark blue cloak and carrying an axe. Uh, and this is a saga moment we'll see over and over again. Uh, the writer's use of Blaumklavum, or a dark cloak or a dark blue cloak, to indicate a man bent on a killing. Right. And you could pay – as we go through this podcast, we'll see this time and again. Um, clothing is – tends to be pretty important in sagas. Um, Absolutely. So we'll, we'll try to keep track of what people are wearing. Uh, mm-hmm. The brighter and flashier the clothes are, the, the better. Right. This year's Saga Man. Uh, he and Einar, uh, Robinkel and Einar, exchange pleasantries before he gets down to brass tacks and asks him about riding Freyfaxi. Einar acknowledges riding the horse, and Robinkel, despite expressing regret about it, strikes Einar dead on the spot. Well, now, what's wrong with Einar? Why wouldn't he say something like, uh, huh? Me? No. He's a man of honor. <laughs> he's a shepherd yeah. of honor. He, well, he may we be see only what that a shepherd. Him. But he's a shepherd of honor, I should hope. All right. Let this be a lesson to all you shepherds out there. That's correct. If you get caught riding the wrong horse, you say, not me. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, we're not the only ones who think this is a little extreme. Einar's father demands compensation for the death. Uh, unexpectedly, Ravenkel agrees. He expresses regret for Einar's death, and he breaks with his policy of non-compensation by offering a substantial settlement to Thorbjorn. Uh, but it's, it's a little more complicated than that, right? Yes, Hrovenkel doesn't exactly say, uh, you're right, I killed your son and I owe you a debt, um, which would right. be a, a basically admitting to doing something wrong legally. Mm-hmm. Um, Hrovenkel is a man uh, that goes by the letter of the law. So it, he, he, he says, no, I won't pay you compensation, but because I feel bad about this whole ordeal um, and Einar was a good man, I'm willing to take you and your family under my wing for the rest of your lives. Mm-hmm. Um, which seems quite fair, to be well, honest. And, but um, it's but worth it's noting against... that everyone in the saga, except for Thorbjorn, reacts when they hear about the settlement offer. They react by saying, are you mad? That was yes, a very, very exactly. generous offer. Right. You'd have done uh, quite that... well out of it. Thorbjorn goes to his brother Bjarni and says, uh, here's here's what I was offered. And Bjarni says, you're an idiot. <laughs> he he offered you a very fair Indeed. deal. This is Hrofenkel who never offers a deal right. of any kind. Now, the, the distinction but, here is that Hrofenkel is not offering uh, a deal that says he did something wrong. He's offering right. a deal that says, I'm your superior. You will continue to be my subordinate. Right. Um, here's how we'll go forward. But and for that reason... It's a pretty good deal. For that reason, Thorbjorn rejects it. He wants an outside arbitrator to decide the case between them. Uh, and here's Hrofenkel, the thing that... Robinkel says that this is an insupportable arrogance on Thorbjorn's part, exactly. treating them as if they were equals. 
Which and is unacceptable it. to Hrolf and Kel throughout Absolutely. the whole saga. Absolutely. Uh, so Thorbjorn, it must be said, Thorbjorn doesn't actually know anything about the law. So he has to recruit his nephew, Sam Bjarnason, to be his lawyer. Sam. What I know. Of... Now, we've read a lot of sagas, <laughs> and it's very rare... Not a lot of Sams. ...that we encounter a Sam. Now, admittedly, his name would be something like Sjalm in sure. Icelandic. absolutely. But we're going with the English translations and the English pronunciations. It's Sam. It's a bit jarring. His brother's name is Eivind, his father's name is Bjarni... And there's yeah, we Sam. got Hrofenkel, we're going to have a Thorkel and a Thorgir. And a Presumably it's a maternal grandmother or something. Sam. Mm-hmm. Disappointing. Disappointing yes. name. And his profession isn't any better. He's a, an ambulance chaser. He's a small-time lawyer who specializes in local cases. Uh, an outlawry case against a chieftain is way beyond his expertise. And it's worth noting, though, that lawyers in Icelandic sagas are really, really, really important. Um, a lot of the right, drama true. surrounds it's not feuding Sam. and then the settlement of feuds at, at the thing or the all thing. Um, lawyers yes. and their ability to speak well and all that stuff is, is quite important. But it's underscored in this saga that Sam is not a big He's not a very lawyer. good he's, lawyer. No. He's, <laughs> this is he, not the it, guy who they're writing sagas about. Right. If you want to call him an ambulance chaser, maybe that's okay. I don't think it says that exactly, but that, that's a... It's a, it's uh, a loose translation. A loose translation <laughs> of Sam's profession. All right, um, I'll go with that. Sam... Does not terrify Hrovenkill. In fact, Hrovenkill laughs when he hears that Sam has brought a case against him. Uh, but the following summer, Sam and Thorbjorn uh, beat Hrovenkill to the all thing and set about trying to gain support for their case. They can't find anybody to take it on uh, because everyone sort of knows that Hrovenkill is a brutal foe. And they're on the verge of giving up when they meet uh, Thorkel Thjosterson, who's called Thorkel Locke due to his lock of white hair. Thorkel and his Are brothers the- share a chieftaincy which is maintained by his brother Thorgir. Uh, Thorkel is able to convince Thorgir to help Sam and Thorbjorn through a ruse involving Thorgir's sore foot. Uh, Thorgir agrees to help, but he says he's skeptical about their chances against Ravnkel. Uh In the event, Ravnkel's arrogance proves to be his undoing. Sam goes to court and makes his case against Ravnkel, but Ravnkel's still in his booth. He has to be told uh, by messengers that he's being tried for Einar's death. Sam turns in the performance of a lifetime. Everyone's impressed with his handling of the case. And when the time comes for Hrovenkill to answer the charges, the crowd pressed in around the court is so tightly packed that Hrovenkill can't get through to make his defense. And so he's outlawed on the spot. This is one of those many occasions where Hrovenkill is caught kind of napping, as it were. Yes. Right? Yes. He's a man who doesn't like to expend unnecessary energy. He's so uh, confident in his position mm-hmm. that he he typically delays uh, reacting because um, he doesn't think anything can happen to him. Well, and this so is here's... the only time that he pays the price for it either. Right. So here he gets his, right? Yes. Uh, Frothigel leaves the all thing pretending nothing's happened. Uh, but everyone else at the all thing is sort of celebrating that Frothigel has finally been brought down. Uh, once he's gone, Thorgir points out to Sam that Sam is in for trouble when he gets home. Uh, and the brothers offer to accompany him back to hold the confiscation court that will make Hrovenkill's outlawry stick. So Sam and the Thostersons ride back across Iceland and assault Hrovenkill's farm at sunrise. Now, this is exactly what you were talking about. Once again, uh, when everyone else is already up and working, Hrovenkill is caught in bed, um, still sort of lounging around. And so he's dragged from his bed without a fight. Right. And he left, he heard the outlawry sentence at the oh, yes. all thing. But then decided to kind of shrug it off, and he went home, and then goes to sleep. Yes. Well, because there's a wide gap between being outlawed and actually being forced to leave. Mm-hmm. Right. You actually must enforce the judgment. So here he's got Sam and Thorbjorn, and he's not really imagining that they, they can muster any strength to, right. to oust him. But, but they bring the Theostrasons, and the Theostrasons bring 80 men uh, to assault <laughs> yeah. the farm. So they, it's sort of overkill. Uh, Thorkel, Locke, and Thorgir then um, cut holes in the tendons of the prisoners' legs uh, and run a rope through the wounds before hanging them upside down from a clothesline outside the Oof, building. That it's, uh, is it's pretty grim stuff. Beautifully gruesome. This is the kind of stuff we come to the sagas to see. That's exactly right. Uh, and as you'd imagine, it gets Ravnkel's undivided attention. Good uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Uh, the Theostasins advise that Sam should kill Ravnkel at once. But Sam allows Hrovenkill to live. Although, what? I know. Okay, well, John. Well, yes? We, we've we read, as I said, a lot of sagas. If you 
torture someone, <laughs> which we never see in the sagas. Right. You don't torture anybody. Uh, you better kill the guy, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to imagine uh, Robin Gill taking this lying down, as it were. Well, he can't get up because his legs are right. <laughs> right. Well, he can't so. he can't get down because his legs are tied up. Right, right. Um, All but right, Sam so don't kill him. Well, but Sam takes everything from him. He takes the farm. He takes the livestock. He takes the chieftaincy. Uh, Ravenkel is left uh, only with his wounded legs and his wounded name. He has to buy a new farm on credit, uh, and he names it Ravenkelstead because, you know, as we know, he's a bit of an arrogant fellow. Uh, meanwhile, Sam holds a feast for his new neighbors and offers to be their chieftain. And we're actually told that they are reluctant to accept him as their leader. Um, and before they leave for home, the Theostracins help Sam establish his position by performing one final service for him. They burn down the temple to Frey, and they kill the horse Freyfaxi. Oh, poor Freyfaxi. I know. When Robinkel learns about Freyfaxi's death, he responds stoically, I think it's a vain thing to believe in the gods. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's been busy rebuilding his life as a farmer, and he turns out to be very good at it. He rises to power and wealth again, uh, and builds a second chieftaincy. He and Sam act politely when they can't avoid each other, and six, six years pass like this. Rothenkel is quite a, uh, a a noble guy. Maybe not noble. He's an entrepreneur. Maybe that's the way I want to put it. Yes. He, I think that's he, a fair He's a guy who knows what he wants, uh-huh. and he can get it, right? Uh-huh. Well, and again, he's not one to waste unnecessary energy. Right? He's, he's right. not well, in a he, position he, to take revenge, and so he doesn't try. He, he rises from nothing after yeah. getting his inheritance from his father early. Right. And then he loses everything and then builds up a whole new chieftaincy. And he's not done yet. Uh, when Sam's brother Avond returns from a seven years trip trading abroad uh, and begins to make his way to Sam's new home with all of his pack horses and five other men to help him make the trip, he rides past Ravenkill's farm. Uh, and when he does this, a washing woman sees the travelers and runs in to scold Ravenkill for his inactivity until he's finally roused to action. Uh, when he does uh, rise, he goes, moves quickly. He throws together a posse of his neighbors and sons, uh, 18 men, we're told, and they ride out after Avon's party. And then there's this chase across the moors, sort of one of the famous scenes from this saga. Avon insists he has no quarrel with Ravenkel, but nevertheless pushes on through the mire in, at a high pace, while Ravenkel, who knows the land better, steadily gra- gains ground on him. Uh, yeah, eventually, is, uh, Avon realizes this... he can't escape, and he halts the group at a knoll to, that offers sort of a defensive position. Can, can I just say it's a little bit ridiculous on Avon's part as you just saw your brother. Mm-hmm. Your brother tells you, hey, there's this guy, Ravenkel. You remember this big chieftain that we used to live under? Um, yeah, I strung him up by his uh, ankles. <laughs> with all You his, really enjoy the ankle stringing up, don't you? With, with all his men and everything. and Oh, but I let him live. and. Right. On the way, on, on your route, you're going to run by his house, maybe. So, uh, eh, don't worry. Everything will be fine. Well, it's an open question. I mean, Avond says he has no quarrel with Ravenkill, but sure. he has to know that Ravenkill has a quarrel with his entire family. Exactly. Uh, he can't be ignorant of that. Hasn't uh, this guy lived in middle, midi- medieval Iceland his whole life? He's, he's certainly he not know. going to admit to any concern. Right? He should know the deal. It would, it would reduce his position... To admit that he's concerned about what's what's going on. I see. Uh, there's actually no words spoken between the two groups. And this is, again, rather unusual. Uh, there's no uh, one-liners exchanged. There's no shouted threats. Uh, Ravnikel and his men simply arrive and attack. Uh, when that happens, Avon's servant jumps onto a horse and runs off, rides off to alert Sam. Uh, Sam immediately gathers 20 men and rushes to the scene... But when he gets there, the fighting's already over. Uh, Avond and his five remaining men are all dead, as are 12 of Ravenkill's followers, 18 this followers. This poor guy. Yes. What a welcome home. Right? I know. You, Seven you years go abroad. overseas, you, you, you make all this money, you come back in your fancy clothes, and then you get killed. Right. Welcome home, Avond. <laughs> uh, Sam, of course, it wants revenge. He puts out the word that he wants all of his supporters to gather at his house in the morning for a full assault on Ravenkel's farm. But Ravenkel, finally, finally learning to get up early, sets back out at night and arrives at Athelbal when everybody's sleeping. 
Good for him. See? Sam is dragged from his bed and not strung up by his ankles. He's given the same choice that he once gave Ravenkel. To die or to live in compliance with his enemy's demands. Sam chooses to live, but he nurses his grievances for the rest of his life. And there's no torture. None. None. Ravenkel says... Demonstrating that Ravenkel perhaps uh, has learned, has grown, has matured, or... Well, I... It's disappointing either way. Well, I'm he, fair enough. He doesn't torture. I'm sorry. Uh, he does make one more trip across Iceland. He visits the Theostrasons and asks for their help again against Ravengel. Uh But this time they refuse. They remind him that they told him to kill Ravengel when he had the chance. Exactly. And Sam uh, has his nose out of joint and leaves them on bad terms. Meanwhile, Ravengel's sons survive the battle on the moors and grow up to take over the farms at Athelbal and Ravengelstead. Ravenkel is well thought of by his followers and dies a powerful man. Well, what happens to Sam and his uh That's people? it. He spends the rest of his life dreaming of revenge and never achieving it. Oh, that's sad. It's so sad. It's a little bit sad. All right, that's our story. Uh, so now it's time to dig into this a little bit deeper. Uh, Andy, where do you want to start? Um, well, I mean, just looking around and anyone who reads the, the saga is going to come across the same thing. What is with Hrofenkel? Um <laughs> What do you mean? It, uh, well, there are a couple schools, or maybe a couple is hard. It's it's kind of three or four, maybe, schools of thought about Hrofenkel's character. And I'll start with just my, my general impression. Stuff. You know, when you're reading the saga or when you're exposed to it for the first time, uh, you encounter Hrofenkel, who's this arrogant, overbearing chieftain. Mm-hmm. And when Sam strings him up that first time, I, I think we're mostly rooting for Sam. That's one of the, the schools of thought, is that Hrofenkel is just this arrogant, overbearing dude who mm-hmm. who deserves what he gets. Um, right, but up till now, we've seen the heartbroken father of a dead man uh, desperately trying to sort of muster up some kind of a exactly, case against yeah. his son's killer. And, it's and hard the to only of sympathy for Hrofenkel at that point in the story, right? And the only the only complaint that Hrofenkel can really bring forward is that he rode my horse, which <laughs> you know, to, to my modern, fosterling. Let's remember, yeah, Not just to, to modern to modern readers, to modern audiences, that that might seem a little petty. Fair enough. Um, to Hrofenkel, it's certainly not. But Hrofenkel, you know, if you're going with the, this school of thought that he's he's a brute from start to finish, uh, then it fits because he, he, he wants to see himself as superior. He mm-hmm. believes he's superior and he's going to stomp on the little people the whole way through. Mm-hmm. Um, indeed, when he gets the opportunity to crush Sam, he does. Um, so some people see him as a brute, right? He, yes. he never really changes. Um, there's another school of thought that says he's arrogant and overbearing at the beginning, but that after he is he gets his comeuppance from Sam at the at the all thing, um, that he reforms. That this is a, a chieftain who who learns a lesson, and this is a really rare thing in the sagas mm-hmm. uh, that you find a character who who is in process or he's he's going through a progression of development, um, or at the very least changes. learning how to pretend to care about others because it helps him to build a more stable chieftaincy. Well, that sounds kind of negative. Well, all right. It's, 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 <laughs> but that is one of the one of the interpretations, right? That uh, So Theodore M. Anderson, who anyone who studies sagas uh, is familiar with that name. Um, and if you aren't familiar with that name, I suggest you look him up. Um, Theodore M. Anderson describes him as the consummate politician who... Mm-hmm. Suffers some setbacks, yes, but he ends up rallying in the end. Um, Anderson goes on to say that, you know, we can look at this text through one of two lenses. It's either a political lens in which we're really focusing in on this, the office of the chieftain and what it takes to be a chieftain. Mm -hmm. Or we can focus in on that moral lens and say, wow, his behavior seem immoral, corrupt, wrong, um, so on and so forth. Uh, Anderson ends up concluding, though, that... Uh, it's a kind of a combination of both. He says the text offers, quote, an array of the deficiencies that afflict the Icelandic chieftaincy, that this is really a, a text that's looking at the office of the chieftain and and whether it's Hrofenkel or Sam or anyone, 
we're going to run into a lot of problems mm-hmm. along the way. And these are some of the things that we'll run into. Um, so, again, we have two schools that we've, we've kind of covered. I think that he ultimately can be viewed as not entirely bad, mm-hmm. right? There's a, a, a scholar, uh, Jan Gare Johansson, who uh, published, um, I think, in the 90s, mid-90s maybe, um, an article, The Hero of Hrofenkel's Saga, and he argues that Hrofenkel is shown in a positive light from start to finish, which is a really Ooh, that's, uh, boy, that's, controversial that's a... <laughs> position, right? You know, tr- traditionally, mm-hmm. Hrofenkel is viewed as a brute. Um, some people would argue that he, he, he rallies, learns his lesson, becomes a better person. Johansson's saying Hrofenkel from the Resists very beginning. Resists slopping anybody else's head off for riding the wrong horse. He's But but if you look at the law, and I mean, this is the argument of the article, if you look at everything that happens in the text, Hrofenkel is always justified, right? Einar, Einar does break his oath, mm-hmm. and he knows the consequences of doing so, but he does it anyway. And so Hrofenkel goes ahead and fulfills his oath. What kind of man would he be, one might argue, if he swore an oath to kill anyone who rode Feyfaxi? And then Einar rides him and he said, oh, well, you know, I, I made this <laughs> this solemn vow to the gods and before mm-hmm. all these men, uh, I'm never mind about that. Well, and I'll – this is actually um, – maybe this is a good time to move on to my, my interest in uh, the lawsuits. Okay. Uh, which in this saga uh, – there's tremendous uh, uh, fertile ground for discussion here. Uh, but the lawsuits in this saga, it's worth noting that although Hrabenkel has clearly earned his reputation as a harsh and merciless person, I'm sorry, I'm not buying that he's a good guy from the beginning, uh, he's always very careful to operate within the law and within his rights. Right? Uh, according to the Gragas, right, the, the written version of the laws of Iceland, there are nine types of assault in Iceland punishable by outlawry. Uh, what we're looking at in Hrofenkel's saga, in the fight with Einar, the fight, uh, in the killing of Einar, is type six. Einar kind of just stands there, doesn't he? Right. It? It's really a fight when you just sort of stand there with your shepherd's crook say, yeah, I rode the horse. Uh, <laughs> and, and basically, uh, Hrofenkel says, I'm going to kill you now. And Einar says, okay. He doesn't say anything. <laughs> uh, he, seems, he, just... he seems to take it very calmly, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. So this is actually type six uh, assault when one man fells another, which I mean, you'd think all successful assault would fall into that category. But there you are. The law is written as follows. So where one where men go only one way from a killing, then the killer is to publish the killing as his work within the next 12 hours. He is to go to the first house where he thinks his life is in no danger on that account and tell one or more men legally resident there and stated in this way. There was an encounter between us, he is to state, and name the other man and say where it was. If he leaves the man dead, he is to cover the corpse so that neither birds nor beasts may eat it. He must say where it is. If he does otherwise, it is murder. So, Provenkel rides home to Athelbal, announces that he's killed Einar, and then sends men to have, to bury Einar's body west of the shepherd's hut, and then has a cairn raised over it, has rocks placed placed on top of it. So the saga writer goes out of his way to demonstrate that Hrovenkel is a killer, not a murderer. Right? Mm-hmm. That distinction is an important one for a saga. Murderers are the lowest form of scum. Killers, quite frequently, as you said, are justified. Yeah, and you, find you see a lot justified. of killing in the sagas. That's one of the things that makes the sagas interesting, is there's a lot of action, a lot of killing... A lot of bloodshed. Absolutely. And the, these are, in many ways, Vikings. Maybe mm-hmm. they don't go a Viking, as it were. But, uh, go a Viking. They, they love a good killing now and then. Absolutely. But uh, they're not murderers. No, no. And that's the thing, is that there's a really clear difference. There are mm-hmm. murderers in the sagas. Right? But they're almost uniformly, if they aren't very, very powerful men as well, uh, treated as common criminals. Treated as people right. to be put down. Right. Uh, where uh, people who kill and do so publicly and openly have to be dealt with sort of within the law. Yeah. Uh, well, are, then, hmm? what do you make of the, the Avent slaying then? Because well, here's, here's what's interesting about mm-hmm. that one, and, and maybe this is, this is pretty typical of Hrovenkel's uh, killings. It's always done right near his property or in the territories that he controls, so he can kind of just go home. And tell his washerwoman or whoever right. that he killed 
whoever it is, right? His, his enemy. So in the case of Avon, Avon's running by his house. He chases him down. Mm-hmm. And the first house he goes back to after completing that killing, as far as the saga makes clear, he goes home. Right. Tells the people in his own uh, house that yes. he killed Avon. Uh, he doesn't cover that body, but I think he assumes Sam's on his way. Um, and Sam will cover it up, maybe. Yeah, it's not terribly clear whether he intends to do anything about the pile of corpses left out on the moors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not just Avon. It's Avon and some 16 or 17 other people right. all piled up around him. Uh, and in that case, it's a little bit less clear. But, of course, we also don't know whether Hravenkel actually kills anyone. Right? We don't actually see that fight. I think uh, I, I, he. it would be a tragedy if he hadn't killed anyone. I agree. Uh, but the curtain of obscurity is pulled over the scene. Yeah. We know nothing. We follow the servant back home to Sam. Um, right. And so we see the corpses, but we have no idea who's responsible for whom. Well, uh, what do we make of uh, of that scene? Is that, you know, some people, those who say that, that Hravenkel is a brute who never changes, always point to that particular scene with, with Avend, that Hravenkel finds out that Avend, this innocent guy mm-hmm. who just came home from his travels, and yeah, he's wealthy now, and so on and so forth, but he wasn't involved in... The, the feud, really. He's just a, a, a bystander, only related by blood to to Sam. He's Sam's brother, but does he deserve to be killed for this? Well, he's not involved in the feud by his own action, by his own hand, but of course, as the brother of one of the yeah. major figures in a feud, he's he's involved by proxy. Uh, right. But also, Avon's trip home, or Avon's trip to Sam's new home, uh, takes him and his caravan past Travenkel's new farm, and that may be a provocation. Uh, there's reason to think that Avon uh, is sort of moving out of his way to irritate Travenkel or to rub Travenkel's nose in his family's good fortune. Uh, right. Just let me set the scene for you. Avon is riding in the early morning, right? So the sun clearly shows off him and his men as they ride past Travenkel's farm. They've got. 16 pack horses laden down with treasure and uh, goods from overseas. Avend is described as wearing uh, very brightly colored clothes, right? That sort of rainbow clothing that uh, uh, successful traders often wore home to Iceland to show off that they've been successful. And they ride um, slowly and in file past the farm at a time when people will be up and about and can see them. There are similar mm-hmm. rides in other sagas. Uh, in Njal's saga, uh, Atkel rides past Gunnar Hamundersen's farm. Uh, in uh, Valtensdala's saga, Berg the dog rides past Thorstein's homestead. Uh, it's mm-hmm. always taken as a deliberate challenge. Anytime you ride immediately past the farm of somebody with whom your family has a feud, you're trespassing. Right? You're, you're crossing their property in order to be within sight of their home. And you're indicating a contempt for them and for uh, their home. In fairness, no matter how provocative Avon's being, it does no good if Ravenkel doesn't see it. And because it's right. happening early in the day, as we know, Ravenkel is still in bed. <laughs> yeah, he's sleeping. <laughs> but there, there's there's the washerwoman. Right. right. Well, thank thank God, or I guess I guess uh, the great tragedy, perhaps, is that the washerwoman is there. Well, the washer. She's a really interesting character. This washerwoman. It's a. It's a. It's one of those uh, defining moments of the of the saga when she sees these riders. Um, she's out there washing. Robin Kell's in bed. Um, there's some pretty interesting details. Um, I'll, I'll read a little uh, a bit of the washerwoman uh, piece mm-hmm. because I think in the washerwoman um, passage we find some of the answers to Robin Kell's motivation for attacking Avent rather than attacking Sam. When she saw the riders, she bundled together the linen and ran up to the farm. She threw the laundry down beside the log pile outside the door and burst into the room. Uh, as John said, Hrofenkel had not yet got up, and <laughs> some of his most trusted men were resting in the hall. But all the farmhands had gone to work. That's a great detail right there. Yeah, Hrofenkel and all of his men, which this would be any kind of... Uh, uh, important person on the property they're all sleeping but anyone who has actual manual labor to do mm-hmm. they're already working so uh, that might suggest that Robin Kell's continuing this notion of superiority over other people right and that's that's uh, generally not thought of as being evidence 
of um, uh, an admirable person. Uh, right. I'm thinking of uh, Gisli's brother Thorkel in Gisla Saga, uh, who sets off this whole chain of feuds because he lounges around the house when everybody else is working and overhears <laughs> a conversation going on between his friends' wives uh, right. that leads to uh, uh, people dying. Yeah, and, and just lounging around is always bad. In mm-hmm. Ale Saga, right, when he gets older, and there's few more active individuals than Ale mm-hmm. in, in the Icelandic sagas. As he gets older, he becomes impotent. He becomes, uh, well, he's always been grumpy. Uh, but he doesn't move around as much. And so he starts getting, yeah, he gets made fun of by the women in the house for mm-hmm. not moving around. And yes. His, his lack of, of masculinity is is a highlight. So this woman, uh, this washerwoman, does something similar to uh, to Ravenkill in terms of shaming him for his inactivity. Uh, and this is a typical kind of thing that we see with women in the Icelandic sagas. What's weird about this particular one is that usually a saga, uh, the cold council of women comes from a, a wife or a mother or a sister, someone of blood relation mm-hmm. to the person who was killed. And then he go, they go to the uh, their, the nearest relative, ma- male relative, and says, "Hey, what do you what have you been doing with yourself? Why don't you get out there and and avenge mm-hmm. your brother or avenge your father or whatever?" Um, sometimes they'll throw a, a bloody rag at them, saying, "This is the this is the blood of your kinsman. Go slay his killer." <laughs> in this case, it's a washerwoman. The right, the washerwoman mm-hmm. comes in, says she started talking as soon as she came in. She says, the old saying is true enough, the older a man, the feebler. The honor a man is given early in life isn't worth much if he has to give it all up in disgrace and hasn't the courage to fight for his rights ever again. It's a peculiar thing indeed to happen to those who were once thought brave. Well, now, what a slight at Hrofenkel, right? You know, you were once this brave, Mm -hmm. noble guy, and now here you are just sleeping in while... Avond rides by your house. Although, of course, if she'd been with him for any length of time, she'd know that he always sleeps in. He's always slept yeah, in. Exactly. But she's kind of taking the position, it seems, of of that sort of woman of the farm. Uh, Robin Kill is married. Right? We have one reference to his wife, Odbjorg, uh, at the beginning of the saga, but she never makes an appearance. Uh, and there aren't any other uh, women around. I mean, this, this washerwoman and the serving woman earlier mm-hmm. who reports that uh, Freyfax is at the front door may be the same woman, for all we know. Uh, but in any case, Ravenkel doesn't seem to have a kind of woman of the house uh, who would take on normally that role of the, the counselor. Right. Uh, and so his serving him. women seem to take on that role for him. It's weird. And you'll see, in uh, you know, for all of our listeners out there, in the sagas, women play a very, very important role in the Icelandic mm-hmm. sagas. They often run the farms, um, um, whether the man's there or not. So they, they, they're pretty important people. Um one of the things the, this washerwoman does is then create a contrast. She just said he, she just reminded Hrofenkel of who he used to be. Um, now he's an older man and a little less active. And then she says, "As for those who grew up with their father, now here she's talking about about Sam and Avond, right? Mm-hmm. If you remember, Hrofenkel didn't grow up with his father." He took his inheritance early and established his farm right. on his own. Right. I suppose it depends on what you consider to be grown up. Exactly. But typically in the sagas, you'll see a man grow up and become a full adult even right. through his first marriage because they sometimes marry many mm-hmm. times. <laughs> they'll, they'll stay with their father. They'll support their father, work that farm, yep. maybe take a, a portion of land right next to the farm, things like that. Hrofenkel abandoned his – well, I shouldn't say abandoned, but he left his father quite early, much earlier than a mm-hmm. typical person would. Which is actually one of those parallels as well. Uh, we're told the same thing about Sam. That his brother Avon stays home for a long time right, and, helps, yeah, that's right. uh, and lives with uh, their father while Sam goes off as a young man to follow his career in law. All right. So she goes on and says, for those who grew up with their father, who to you earlier seemed utterly worthless compared to yourself, it's a different story. For as soon as they reached manhood, they went abroad, traveling from country to country, and when they come back, they're thought very highly of, even above chieftains. Well, what a big slight to, to Rafenkel, who fancies himself as the greatest guy in the world. Here's Avon Bjarnason, who appears to be better than a chieftain. He's above mm-hmm. chieftains, right? So she, she finishes it off. Avon Bjarnason was just crossing the river at Skalafjord, carrying a bright shield that shone in the sun. 
He's a worthy target for revenge, an outstanding man like him. Hmm? The servant woman really let herself go with spirit. Um, other translations say she was gabbling or going on and on. Well, and it's worth um, noting, we said earlier that Provenkel never takes revenge on Sam and never sort of acts directly against Sam. Uh, right. But even then, it's it's this servant woman who marks out Avind as the target. Right. right. She's the one who says, you know, if you get this guy, no one would say he wasn't a legitimate target for revenge. Exactly. Right. So one thing we know from the very beginning is that Hoffenkel fancies himself to be superior to most other men, right? I mean, Sam did get the better of him earlier in the saga, but I don't think Hoffenkel's opinion of Sam's inferiority has really changed much throughout the saga, which is why he doesn't seek vengeance against him. To do so would basically say that Sam is his equal in some way, and he doesn't want to do that at all. So... With the arrival of Avond, who is this well-dressed, wealthy, thought very highly of, as the washerwoman says, even above chieftains kind of guy, I, I think the game changes for Hrofenkel. He, as a superior man, sees a man who is his equal or maybe even slightly above him, and now he's got a target worthy of his, his attention. The question we have to ask then is, has Hrofenkel changed as some critics suggest he has, or is he the same old guy throwing his superiority around? And we'll learn more about that and a few other topics in our judgment section. So let's move on to that right now. Uh, in the concluding section of this podcast, we will look at the saga through a series of lenses. Uh, best bloodshed, body count, nicknames, notable witticisms, outlawry, in which we'll choose a member of the saga to outlaw forever from Iceland. Uh, thing men, uh, Andy and I will each choose a cast member from the saga, a character from the saga to join uh, our uh, Thingman and to support us at Future Things and a rating of the saga uh, and hopefully we will come to some conclusions about Ravkill's character and about some of the other topics that we've discussed to this point. So let's get started. Best Bloodshed all right, best bloodshed. This is a category where we're going to talk about and uh, give an award for the gruesomest, coolest, most interesting scene in which blood is shed. It's one of the things that makes the sagas great. Um, here's the problem, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a lot of bloodshed here. Not a lot of bloodshed. Uh, the the greatest battle that we have is the battle with Hrofenkel and Avent. We have quite a few bodies going down, but uh, we don't really see it happen. You know? So are we John, nominating used that one to... or no? Yeah, we're nominating it just for All the heck right. of it. But, you know, I'm used to seeing spears going through guys' stomachs. I'm used to seeing arms or legs lopped off and then clever mm -hmm. jokes made at the expense of the person who is missing a limb. Uh, that doesn't happen in that scene. But that is a scene where a lot of blood is spilled. So... That's the first one, Avon. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw in, and partly, as you said, because we have only a few options here, uh, I'm going to throw in the death of Freyfaxi. Uh, Freyfaxi, the, a horse. Yes, uh, because they don't just kill the horse. It would be one thing if they just killed the horse. It's how they kill the horse. Uh, the Theostrasons led the stallion across the meadow, and I'm going to uh, read just a bit from the saga here. Uh, and then down along the river. Along the farmstead, there are high cliffs and a waterfall with a deep pool underneath. They led the stallion onto the bluff. Then the Theostrasons pulled a bag over Freyfaxi's head, tied long, heavy poles to his flanks, fastened a stone to his neck, and with the poles, they pushed the horse over the edge. That's good stuff. Now, to me, that means not only do they feel the need to sort of kill Freyfaxi in order to sort of cleanse the farm, cleanse the property... But the, they put the bag over his head, which could just be, you know, it's a horse you're bringing to the edge of a cliff. You right, don't want that's to shy. right. And uh, when I read it, I see them taking a horse up to the edge of a cliff. A horse is not typically going to say, oh, what a nice cliff. I wonder how it would feel to jump off this thing. They... But the, the, the bag over the head, there's only one other kind of individual in the sagas who dies with a bag over their head, and that's a witch. Hmm. Uh, we have a number of witches in the sagas, uh, which are witch are killed exclusively by having a bag put over their head uh, so they cannot uh, give the evil eye. The horse is also a stone is put around his neck, and then the poles sort of leading him off the edge. 
to me, there's something about uh, Freyfaxi that the Theostracins are afraid of. This is a sort of supernatural horse. Right. Uh, well, it's, it's definitely a horse that can tattle on any right. wrongdoers. Right. And there's been foster child to both Ravenkill and a god. And so that death, not terribly bloody, not actually a human being, but certainly the most interesting death in the saga, I think. Absolutely. So the only other one that really comes to mind, John, is the, the torturing of Hrafenkel. It's, mm. a, it's a pretty dramatic scene. In fact, it's one of the more dramatic scenes you'll see in, in saga literature. Um, though this is a short saga, it's really noteworthy for this particular moment. What you have is Sam and the Theosterson show up at the house early in the morning. Uh, like you said, Hrafenkel is still in bed. They take him. Um, they push everyone outside. Women and children are herded into a single room. There's a storehouse, and between the storehouse and the wall of the farmhouse, there's a beam they have for, for drying clothes. And they lead Hrofenkel and his men up to this beam. Hrofenkel is pleading for his men. He's pleading for himself. He knows that Sam is going to do something horrible. He wants his men to be spared. They've done you no harm, he says, but you can kill me without any discredit to yourself. I'm not going to plead for my life, but I ask you not to torture me, for that would bring you no credit. Thorkel, Thorkel Locke, the fancy-haired boy, says, We've heard about how little mercy you've shown to your opponents, and it's only fair you should be made to feel the pain now. Then they got hold of Hrofenkel and his men and tied their hands behind their backs. After that, they broke open the storehouse and took some ropes down off the pegs, and then they drew their knives, cut through the prisoners' heels behind the tendon, pulled the rope through the holes, strung the eight men together, and hung them from the clothesbeam. You're getting just what you deserve, Hrofenkel, said Thorgir. You must have thought it very unlikely you'd ever be so humiliated by anyone as you are now. That is the smack of a prepared speech. That doesn't it seem does. like... It doesn't seem like he's just talking off the cuff. That sounds like he sort of planned to say that. Well, he had that ride across Iceland to put it right, together. Right, fair enough. They had plenty of time when to When I get it there, I'm going to say this. Maybe he ran it by everybody. Yeah, so they leave them hanging there, and they have to do the court of confiscation. Yeah. And so you have these eight men hanging by their tendons. And when Sam and, and Thorgir get back, it says they come back to the farmhouse, took Hrofenkel and his men down, and laid them on the ground. Their eyes were all bloodshot. And... Thorgir says to Sam, I think he's manageable now. Of course he is. <laughs> that, that notion of the eyes being bloodshot, it, it's, it's striking. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a, a minimalist description, but boy, it, it, it suggests someone who's seen this kind of thing. And for that reason alone, the, the gruesomeness of this thing, I think it, it's the, the clear winner. Well, and it's so uncharacteristic. I mean, there's just there's really not a lot of torture sequences in the sagas. No, you don't see that at all. Um, I think it's uh, Arthur McEwen uh, says that this is actually an echo from Homer, uh, that it's actually that it's drawing from Greek traditions. These, this scene of people being sort of strung up by their heels and hung upside down and allowed to allow for the blood to pool in their heads and so forth. Yeah. Uh, it, no matter where it comes from, it's pretty awful. It is, and it, it really it, it's a nice moment for calling into question uh, Sam's character. Yes, uh, Sam appears to be a hero of this text because mm-hmm. he over you know he's the one that that puts uh, Hrofenkel in his place, this big bully, and yet his behavior is not necessarily all that good either. Mm-hmm. All right, so it's voting time. What do you say, Freyfaxi, Hrofenkel's torture, or Avend? I think the decision's easy here. Freyfaxi is a, a really interesting death. Very cool. Avend, not as much. I got to go with Hrofenkel, of course. It's the torturing of Hrofenkel. It's gruesome. It's bloody. It's one of the only scenes of torture in all of the sagas. It is the best bloodshed. I think I'm going to go with that. You've convinced me. <laughs> I came into this pretty sure I was voting for Freyfaxi, but you've convinced me. Yeah. Hrofenkel's torture it beautiful, is. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, well, let's move on to our next category. Body Body count. count. Now, for Hrofenkel's saga, this isn't terribly difficult to figure out, Mm -hmm. but in future episodes, the category is going to prove somewhat challenging as we attempt to sift through and tally all the deaths in each saga. Uh, Unnatural deaths, I think it's key key to point out. Yes, it has to be an unnatural death. If there is a noteworthy natural death, we might mention it. But, sure. but typically for body count, we're talking about people who have died in battle or in mm-hmm. some significant way. I think uh, when we've completed all of our sagas, when we've looked at them all, I think we're going to find that Hrovenkill's saga comes in, it's got to be in the bottom four or five for total body count. Total body count, 18. 
18. Just 18 deaths. It's not a whole yeah. lot, really. Um, I we, can up it by one if you like. You're going to up it by one. I will make an argument that we should be adding Freyfaxi to the list. Freyfaxi is not a human being. John. No, but he's a fosterling. A <laughs> fosterling. So you're going to use you're going to use uh, Hrovenkel's delusions to increase the body count. Well, I don't think you're going to find that many adopted horses. I don't know that this is going to be a problem that we face over and over. Okay, again. so so you want to make a, a new rule that uh, anytime we have a significant pet in these sagas, we're going to count them. Well, it's worth at least mentioning. Okay. Uh, so 18, we have Einar, and then everybody else dies at that big brawl at the Knoll. Yes. Uh, Avon, Avon's servant, three of Travelers who are with him, 12 members of Robin Kill's posse, all dying together in this one spot with absolutely no attention from the saga author pretty sad it is it is so we do get our body count sort of bumped up that way although we don't necessarily get to know anything about how they die or whether they die well or who's responsible for the deaths um and then we have Freyfaxi. so 18 19 if we count a horse All right. so 18 plus one for body count there you go Nicknames. So one of the unique features of the sagas is the proliferation of nicknames. Unfortunately, Ravenkill's saga is one of the least promising sagas for great nicknames, but we'll see what we can dredge up. Uh, obviously, we have to look at the genealogy of Harold Fairhair right at the beginning of the saga. And that's really where the only good nicknames it's, come from. It's very unfortunate. These are totally irrelevant figures in the saga, and yet they provide us with some great names. Yeah. Harold is a key part of the Icelandic settlement and a sort of prototype for the overbearing Norwegian kings we're going to see over and over again in the sagas. We'll spend more time with him in other episodes, but we can't leave out this genealogy because we're desperate for good nicknames. Uh, it was in the days of King Harold Fairhair, the son of Havdan the Black, the son of Gudrod Hunter King, the son of Havdan the open-handed but stingy with meat, the son of Eistein Fart, the son of Olaf Woodcutter the Swedes King. There are some great names in there. Those are good. I will begin by nominating Hafdan, the open-handed but stingy with meat. Stingy with meat. And again, if depending on what translation you get, you might get yes. uh, in the Penguin, um, as I read it, it's Hafdan, the open-handed but unhospitable. Right. Um, uh, but I like the stingy with meat well, much, I think that's, much better. That's the one that actually more accurately reflects the Icelandic, which is Matarilla. Uh, which, for some reason, I'm pronouncing it with an Italian accent. <laughs> Matarilla. Uh, it's, it's a great dish. <laughs> Matarilla. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's it is uh, meat stingy, meat bad. Uh, All right, since you uh, threw that one out mm-hmm. there, I'll throw out uh, the great Eistein fart. Fantastic name. Fantastic name. It's got to be a great story for how he got it. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that that comes up in any other saga. I don't know that I've seen him anywhere else. I mean, unless he's not referred to as Eistein fart somewhere else, and he's just right. Eistein somewhere else. Uh, depending on which translation you get, you might just see Eistein Fret yeah, I've seen in, that. in the text because you get some translators that are a bit squeamish. Yes. I don't think they can get that one by. Some deal squeamus of farting, uh, to quote Chaucer. Yeah. Uh, we can throw in Thorka Locke uh, for his streak of white hair. Yeah, but it just doesn't sound that good. Well, I'm just doing my best here. It'd be nice if there were at least one or two actual characters from the saga in the list. So we're not just doing these people who get mentioned in the beginning. Well, that's... That's why I add uh, the title character. There you go. Hrafenkel Freysgoli. There you go. Right? Um, He's, uh, that's a decent nickname, and it rolls off the tongue nicely. Right. It has a nice uh, sound to it. Uh, and my last contribution is going to be Gitav. Um, Goatdale, the spot named after the poor dead goats that Halford left behind to be crushed by an avalanche. I kind of like it. It's got sort of a Wild West sound to it, like Dead Horse Creek or something. Except it's just Goat Dale. Except it's just Goat Dale. Yeah, you know, it's not dead. <laughs> the implication, the, the dead is implied. Oh, I guess so. But Dead Horse Creek sounds a lot cooler than Goat Dale. If it was like yes. a crushed Goat Dale, that would be a little more, yes. more appropriate. Um, I'll add into the list Olaf Woodcutter, King of the Swedes. Ah. I like Olaf Woodcutter. Mm-hmm. What kind of king is, is uh, going out cutting wood? Don't you have people to do that for you? It's a hobby. I imagine it doesn't refer to him cutting wood. Uh, it no, must be something, not. something probably clear, clear cutting forests to burn the peasants. Who with. knows what the, the um, story is? Uh, <laughs> so there's our rather sad bedraggled list. 
What's it going to be? Yeah. I know what I'm picking. It will get better in, in future sagas, we promise you. Um, who are you going for on this one, John? Oh, I'm going for Hafdan, the open-handed but stingy with meat. I can't top that name. You know, if it was, um, if I was going with the translation that I had read, Hafdan, open-handed but inhospitable, I would definitely go with Eistein Fart because I like to keep things very highbrow. But Absolutely. you introduced uh, stingy with meat as the phrase. <laughs> I like that. I like that very much. Uh, the award goes to Havdan, the open-handed but stingy with meat. Excellent. All right, our next category. Notable, Notable witticisms. witticisms. All right, so this is our opportunity to look for uh, the one-liners, the bits of description, the uh, sly bits of understatement that give the sagas that certain something that makes them unique. Uh, so, Andy, what do you got for us? Well, I think I'm going to go with, and again, sadly, this saga is not full of wonderful lines. Um, again, it's, it, this is a short saga, and it's very tightly written, so you don't have the uh, the quick witticisms that you find in a lot of the other sagas. Um, I'm going to go with what happens when Thorbjorn, the father of, of Einar, is going in to get the support of the Gothi Thorgir, um, he goes into Thorgir's booth and he's advised by Thorkel, that's Thorgir's brother, to go in there and um, pull on the toe of Thorgir because Thorgir's got a boil on his foot mm -hmm. and he's resting that foot. So he runs in there, pulls on the toe. Thorkel gives this brilliant speech to his brother about how the physical pain he just felt from the pulling of his toe can't possibly match the pain that the father feels at losing his son, blah, 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 blah. And Thorgir wittily replies, well, I didn't kill his son, so there's no need for him to take it out on me. <laughs> I love it. It's good. It's not Oscar Wilde, but it's a... Uh... It'll get us started. <laughs> it's, it, it's a pretty good line. Thorgir doesn't say much in this saga. It's true. As a matter of fact, but... But that's uh, that's his introduction to the saga, and it's it's a hell of an introduction. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, mm -hmm. something a little bit earlier in the saga. Uh, we said earlier that uh, Sam, the ambulance chaser, is reluctant at first to take up <laughs> a case against Travenkill. Uh and he also he also is reluctant because he's one of the many people who tells Thorbjorn that he was a fool to turn down Travenkill's first offer, but. Thorbjorn insists. He criticizes Sam, saying that uh, essentially you ch you kids today uh, like to talk big, but you don't like to actually get involved in anything that scares you. Uh, and Sam's response, the where he agrees to take over the suit, I'm very reluctant to bring an action against Travenkill, said Sam. I'll do so only because we're kinsmen, but I want you to know that in my opinion I'm helping a fool in helping you. All right, so those are the t the only two good lines in the whole text. <laughs> and I think, you know, a uh, an honorable mention to I think it's a vain thing to believe in the gods. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. But not uh, not necessarily But not really funny. clever. Not a not a yeah. witticism per se. All right. So those are two somewhat notable witticisms, and now we're going to get down to the dirty work. Up next. Oh, oh glory. So it's time to decide. Somebody in this saga is being outlawed. Somebody is being sent out of Iceland, voted off the island, never to return. That seems cruel. Yeah, and again, hard hard in this one. Not a uh, lot of... I don't think it's going to be that hard to find someone to kick out. <laughs> really? I can think of a couple of people see, I would like to see the back of. Okay. The, the obvious choice seems to be Hrofenkel, right? Well, we have to put him in there, obviously. You say, Hrofenkel is this uh, nasty dude. He's He doesn't pay compensation. Um, mm -hmm. He bullies people. Uh, he throws his weight around. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I want to outlaw this guy, though. Uh, well, now the problem is we're both going to have to choose a thing man as well. And, boy, there aren't a lot of people you'd want as a thing man. And it'd be a shame to see one of them put on a ship and sailed off. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you a couple of other ideas. Um, this is kind of a, a, a curveball, but I would say uh, Einar... Uh, who is guilty of oath-breaking, let us not forget. Yes, he is. Uh, perhaps Hrobinkel's response is extreme, but Einar did make an oath that he would never be so uh, so awful as to ride the horse of the man who'd asked him not to. And I guess uh, it, that's a good one, too, because Hrobinkel does say right before he kills him, look, um, I'm going to kill you now because if you're the kind of guy that breaks an oath, uh, <laughs> then what, what's going to come of you in the future? 
So he has a mm-hmm. it's a reasoned res- as much as that can be a reasoned response. Right. He says I'm going to avoid future trouble mm-hmm. by getting rid of you right now. Something that Sam should have considered when he had Hrofenkel at his feet Absolutely. Um, and didn't and do. And speaking of which, my next nominee. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to put uh, Sam Bjarnason uh, right up there on the chopping block. I think so too. Sam uh, is mm-hmm. he strikes me as a, a bit of a failure. I think he is. I mean, he's a he's a uh, he's not a, an unsuccessful lawyer, but that doesn't make him a good human being. No, um, he's uh, arrogant. Uh, he's obnoxious. He makes bad decisions. Although that's not really a reason to exile somebody. Um, but <laughs> yeah, um, you made a bad decision. Uh, you're, 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 you have to leave uh, your native country <laughs> and forfeit all of your property. Uh, uh, sorry, it's Sam, worth noting. Out. I mean, we're not necessarily told everything about this guy's personal life. But we do know that when the neighborhood learns that he's the new chieftain, they are not happy about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do they do say that there's a little bit of hesitation there, that uh, not everybody thinks he's going to be a good chieftain. Not everybody is comfortable with the idea of him being in charge. But is it like that moment when uh, you find out that the uh, the lawyer whose picture is on the, uh, th- the bus stop benches his, uh, and he's got <laughs> posters everywhere, he turns into the mayor of the town and you're like, oh boy. Not good. So this is gonna, yeah. So this is the uh, picture of Sam Bjarnason kicked by a sheep. Yes, kicked. call Sam Bjarnason. <laughs> <laughs> Relative um, fell down a well. <laughs> um, and now I just to just to even out, just so we have uh, uh, an extra name to throw in there. I will throw in uh, Thormod Thjostrason, who, uh, according to uh, Lannama book, does exist, but according to this saga, doesn't. Um, he doesn't show up at the all thing, and even when Sam visits the the Theostrasons at Thorskafjord, uh, he's not there. And for that crime uh, alone, he should be exiled. Apparently, he's already been exiled. Yeah. Is the only problem because Full he's not outlawed for around. this loser. Uh, but so those are our choices. What do you say? Uh, I don't know. Those aren't good choices because none of them really, in my opinion, deserve full outlawry. Uh, mm-hmm. Hrofenkel, yeah, he starts out. If 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 the Hrofenkel story ended with um, uh, him killing Einar and then getting mm-hmm. his comeuppance by Sam, I would say Hrofenkel remains a bad guy. He does seem to recover quite a bit. He doesn't seem to be the horrible person. Yeah. Um, although that's that's one of the points it's of a contention. Story. A, a lot of scholars don't think so. Well, a lot of scholars aren't here. I, he he's set up as an extremely proud figure, mm-hmm. and he gets a deserved comeuppance. Does he recover in the end? I think he does. And mm-hmm. for that reason, I can't I can't outlaw the guy. Um, he's also a bit more fair. Yeah, uh, he does uh, he does offer um, uh, Thorbjorn a reasonable settlement, one that Bjarni thinks is quite fair. Mm-hmm. The issue there, of course, is he wants a position of power. He doesn't want to admit he did something wrong, and so he's doing a like you said, an out of court settlement is what he's he's offering. Mm-hmm. But he's not a horrible dude. So no. I'm not outlawing Hrofenkel. What about Sam? Do you, you know, want to throw him out there? Here's here's my logic behind not outlawing Sam. Um, Sam commits no crime. Um, we'd be outlawing him strictly because of his personality. Uh, right. It's more the sin of, of pride. It's well, just it's, pride, I mean, that's right? a sin, though. That's not a crime. If, if you outlaw every prideful person in the Icelandic sagas... Ooh. It's going to be about three people wandering around. It's going to be uh, Gunnar Hamundersen uh, and a couple of uh, shepherds sort of wandering around, lonely and Those sad. Those original Irish monks. Uh, right, exactly. Uh, so I think, I think uh, strictly outlawing someone because they're prideful and arrogant, uh, that's going to leave us with an awful lot of people being thrown out. Exactly. Which, again, uh, that's why you, I don't think you can uh, throw Hrofenkel. His, his mm-hmm. crime is, again, pride. He, well... <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> He's the one who they actually decide is is deserving of outlawry within the context of the I would guys. point out that he didn't get to plead his case at all. He wasn't allowed to come fair in. Fair enough. A fair point. A fair point. But I think I am going to nominate the one member of the saga who is unequivocally guilty of violating his word. I am going to say that Einar has got to go. Poor Einar. I, I think I'm gonna. It's, it's tough on him. For lack of a better um, choice, again, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go with you on that. Einar's out. You know what I'm gonna say though? I'm gonna say minor outlawry. Minor right, outlawry. Three years exile. That sounds good. A chance for him to go out and make his living in the world. He'll, he can come back a successful man. He can come back with his reputation only enhanced, and put all this behind him. Uh, so Einar, best of luck to you. 
but I'm afraid we must say goodbye. At least you're not dead. That's true. We exile you rather than kill you, so that's nice. That's good. A second lease on life. All right. So long, I know. Right. Thing man. Okay, now this is where it gets contentious. Mm, perhaps. Um, each of us has to choose one character from the saga to be the first member of a dream team of saga characters who will support us uh, over the course of saga thing. So, again, there are not a lot of choices here. Uh, mm-hmm. An obvious choice is going to be Hroff and Kel. Um, I think mm-hmm. another, you have two other choices possibly, like uh, Thorgale or uh, Thorkel or Thorgear. Um, based on All good his choices. Su- on the other hand, you know, Sam's a good lawyer and, you know, you might need one. I'll get a good lawyer later on. <laughs> I'm not worried about a lawyer. You've got your eye on the Owl Saga, don't you? I can do better than Sam. <laughs> so, um, Thorgir seems like a good guy. Uh, Thorgir mm-hmm. and Thorkel both. I think I'm going to leave them to you. Because I'm taking Hrofenkel. <laughs> You're taking Hrofenkel? I'm taking... He, ah. he, he is a champion. He is a proven <laughs> winner. And even when he got uh, knocked down, he got back up again. Really? Really? Uh, so... Tub Thumper is going to be the theme song of your thing, man. <laughs> At least this one. All right. Well, all right. See, this is this is exactly what I was afraid of. Uh, you're going to go for the obvious choice. Just this time. Unimaginatively. Just this Unimaginatively time. going for the first and most obvious choice. Uh, leaving me with, frankly, these scraps of the barrel. Uh, now, there's a temptation here for me to really uh, pull a curveball and choose one of Ravenkel's sons. Because his sons go on to be impressive chieftains in their own right. But... I think I'm going to have to go with the flashy pick. I'm picking Thorkel Locke. It's reasonable. He's got a highly developed sense of honor. He believes in doing what's right. He's eager to prove himself by challenging the powerful. That's the kind of man I want on my side. That's That would have been my argument. Had you uh, gone first and chosen Hrofenkel, I would have gone with uh, Thorkel as well. So, would you? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good choice. Well, there you go. But I think in a, in a fight, I might win right now. Well, it's very early going yet. <laughs> Let's wait until we each have three or four. Your guys can't even be bothered to travel the distance half the time. So, I may my guy may sleep in, which means we're unlikely to have to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right, All right. So there's that. Final, final rating. rating. It's time to give our judgment. Our final judgment. What do you rate this saga, John? One through ten. 10 being the best. Well, it's a tidy what little saga, it? and I've got a soft spot for hot, uh, sagas that highlight the legal stuff. But I, I I, think this is a short saga. It's a saga that doesn't give you a tremendous amount to work with in terms of um, uh, subplots, in terms of uh, entertaining dialogue. Uh, but it's a classic saga. It's got all the bits and pieces. Uh, it, there's a reason why it's become the kind of test case for theories about the sagas, it's got every last thing that you expect in a saga, with no uh, with no fat. Uh, it is the Weight Watchers of sagas. I like it. On the other hand, I can't go too high. Uh, in terms of scope, it's barely a saga. The entirety of Robin Kill Saga could get lost in Lockstar Saga's backyard. It's like a saga appetizer. You sound so grim. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll give it a five for being a solid story. And I'll add one for Frey Faxi being shoved off a cliff with a bag on his head. <laughs> so, six. I'm going six, with six. All right. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's one of those sagas. It, it's hard for me because my initial impulse is to rate it really high. But like you said, it's so short. And as we go through our different categories, it it's kind of exposed for not having as much going on as we really want. Um, doesn't have the nicknames we're looking for. The bloodshed's missing. Mm-hmm. When we go through our outlaw resection... None of them are really so horrible that we want to outlaw them, so we... we and honestly, we were kind of scraping the barrel for Thingman as well. You know, but as as far as it being short, it's not that it's it's a poorly written saga. Seeger the Nordahl said, All things considered, Hrofenkel's saga is one of the most perfect short novels in world literature. That's really high praise. Uh, but it doesn't quite offer as much as what we really enjoy in the sagas. And for that reason, I'm going to go with a 6.5. All right, a 6.5 from Andy, a 6 from me. And uh, next time, we're going to be covering Erbija Saga, uh, a more complex saga, uh, but with a lot of our favorite saga figures, including one who I know is Andy's personal favorite, Snorri the Gothi. 
Uh, so until then, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. And be sure to look for new episodes and information about our podcast on our website, sagathingpodcast.wordpress.com. Feel free to leave a comment and or like us on Facebook, where we go by Saga Thing Podcast. And don't be shy about following us on Twitter at Saga Thing Pod. And this social media is a lot of work. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to make it light and fun, but I don't know how to do it.